Welcome to the Black Creator Series, brought to you by Candlewick Press in collaboration with Red Clay Educators, hosted by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, bringing dynamic books, authors, illustrators, and artists to your classroom and to the world. Look for episodes of the Black Creator Series on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Here's Candlewick's Kathleen Rourke to introduce this week's guest. Thanks for joining us. Our guest creator this episode is award-winning author Linda Williams Jackson, whose detail-rich, poignant historical novels, including The Lucky Ones, are woven through with elements of her own childhood growing up in the Mississippi Delta. I now turn the conversation over to Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, a New York Times bestselling author, educator, founder of Red Clay Educators, and co-founder of the Institute for Racial Equity in Literacy. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the Black Creator Series. Hello, Sonia. Thank you. So why historical fiction? Um, When we look at your incredible body of work, we see uh, Midnight Without a Moon, A Sky Full of Stars, and The Lucky Ones, which we will talk about um, in a little bit. But what, what draws you to the genre of historical fiction? I have always admired historical fiction and wondered if it was something that I could do. I was really afraid to try because As you know, you have to go back in time. And usually it's a time when the author has not lived. So that requires a lot of research, a lot of getting the facts straight. And I was really afraid to attempt historical fiction, but I had always wanted to write about my family in the Mississippi Delta. I was, I admired my grandfather who was a sharecropper. And I thought I'd start with a story set during the Great Depression, because when I was growing up, I would hear my mom and my aunts and my uncle, who still lived in Mississippi, talk about growing up uh, on, a, on a plantation and Papa being a sharecropper. And they never made it sound depressing. So I wanted to write a story about <clears throat> a Black sharecropping family during the Great Depression, but they weren't depressed because they they lived off the land. But in uh, about 2013, I believe, my mom mentioned something about Emmett Till. And that changed everything for me because I knew about Emmett Till and I knew he'd been lynched close by my hometown. But to hear my mother speak about him really put it into perspective of how close that uh, murder was to my family. So then I began to wonder how it might have affected them. And I dove in and did the historical thing with Midnight Without a Moon and of course The Sky Full of Stars is a sequel. And then with The Lucky Ones, which is also set in the Mississippi Delta, again, it was a conversation that sparked it, a conversation with my son who wanted to know who RFK was when he saw that on a magazine cover at the grocery store. So I took that deep dive into historical fiction again. I remember auditing my classroom library one year and realizing that the majority of my books featuring characters of color were in fact historical fiction. What do you hope young people will discover as readers of historical fiction and how this genre, these stories, resonate today? I hope they will just dive in and immerse themselves into the stories and really live in the story and feel like they are a part of the story. And I also want them to recognize that we're not that far from the past. No matter how far back it goes, you can always relate something in the present to the past. And I talk to my kids a lot about my life and what went on in the past. And I just think it's important that children connect to the past and know history. It's it's very important that they know history and that they can empathize with people who lived in the past, even our most recent past when we didn't have cell phones. (laughs) How we didn't have uh, Google Maps and how we'd have to print off a map and follow that map to take a road trip. 
And even before then, before we had computers, I'm really dating myself here, but before we even had computers, when we had to go and buy a map, you go into a, a city and you don't know the, the layout. So you go and you buy a map so that you can navigate. And I just, I love that for, as a child, I loved going back. So today I love to take children back. And of course, the issues that you write about, racism, poverty, don't just live in the past, right? They continue to be issues in young people's lives today, in all of our lives. And, you know, perhaps by understanding the longevity and the magnitude of these issues, young people will be galvanized to make changes that that benefits society. What do you want young people to know about Mississippi? You know, why is this such a compelling setting for historical fiction? What are you hoping they'll learn? I would want them to understand the landscape, Mm -hmm. the land itself. Mildred Taylor wrote a book called The Land, and she talks about her family's acquisition of the land. And land is just, it's a, it's a huge deal in the state of Mississippi, and especially if Black people can own land. My family never owned land, but I always admired other Black families who own land. And I think for me, writing from, writing historical fiction about Mississippi for young readers, I want them to see that Mississippi is more than than just what they have seen in the media, that um, Mm -hmm. that the Black people specifically, we were more than just people chopping cotton or picking cotton, but we were also people who had hopes and dreams. And in some cases, yes, a lot of people, a lot of Black people in the South migrated to the North, but there were people like Papa and people like Medgar Evers that Rose references at Midnight Without a Moon who didn't want to leave Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And then you have people like Mr. Foster and the lucky ones who is there. Mr. Foster is a character who could have easily left Mississippi. He didn't have to stay there, but he's one of the people who received his education in Mississippi and then gave back and is trying to help build a better Mississippi for both black and white. So I I think um, to answer that question, to sum it up, I just want them to see a living, breathing Mississippi from a black perspective that yes, it was oppressive, but we still had hopes and dreams and some of us actually wanted to stay here and fight and make things better. So let's talk about um, your book, The Lucky Ones, which is set in Mississippi in 1967 about a boy, Ellis, and his family, his community, really, and the dire economic conditions that many people, particularly Black people, faced. I want to talk about something that I'm noticing in education. Why is it so difficult for people to talk about poverty? And how can books like yours help us to um, unravel, if you will, poverty from shame, to understand it not as a label that defines people, but a condition that's happening to people? I think it's something that's easy, easier to be swept under the rug than to be talked about or to be addressed. I don't live in dire poverty myself anymore. I did grow up that way, but I don't live that way anymore. But I am married to a uh, children's pastor. So I still get to experience it through people who come to church and need help. And sometimes when he's telling me about someone in need, I can barely take it and because my heart is breaking. And mostly because 
a lot of these situations involve children. And I know what it's like to not have food. I know what it's like to not have proper clothing. I know what it's like to be uh, have a home foreclosed on or to just worry about your house being warm in the winter. And it, it breaks my heart. And sometimes I just rather not have to hear it. And that goes back to a scene in The Lucky Ones when Mr. Foster is talking to Ellis Earl about Marion Wright going to Washington, D.C. to talk to the senators and some of the senators in Mississippi, the two senators from Mississippi didn't believe uh, the dire poverty that was going on in, in the Mississippi Delta. And Mr. Foster responds that they're choosing not to because it, it's easier not to feel that pain. And some people block it out. They, they don't feel any pain from other people being impoverished. The only way that I know to address that and be able to help a child remove the shame is to show them that it can happen to anyone. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with how smart you are, how beautiful you are. And you think about some of the people who have been rich in this country and then they lose everything. Mm. So poverty, and that, that might not be the same, but anybody can be broke. Anybody can be destitute. And I love um, how young readers come to learn about um, Marion Wright, um, a name that should be more known and celebrated as she was the person who sounded the alarm about the crisis in uh, Mississippi and called out politicians to try to hold them uh, accountable for the kind of profound food insecurity and poverty that's often thought of uh, internationally, right? A problem other countries on other continents are facing in the world and not an issue occurring in the United States of America. Your novel sheds light on this, as well as illuminating the work of Marion Wright, her husband, Peter Edelman, and how Robert Kennedy's visit um, brought national attention to this crisis. And I want educators to know that they can invite students to learn more about Marion Wright Edelman today and the Children's Defense Fund, as well as research the issues of food and housing insecurity today in the United States and the ways activists are working to end this. Linda, I've taught affluent children who by fifth grade felt that a person was poor if they only had one or two bathrooms in their home, or if a person lives in an apartment rather than a house. And so, how do we help students differentiate between poverty and privilege? Poverty, what I would tell those children, is when a person's basic needs cannot be met. Mm -hmm. But just because someone chooses to live a certain way does not mean they're in poverty. It's a choice to not have a, a large house or drive a luxury car or um, go out to eat twice a week or three times a week. I have no idea how, how many times a week people who are privileged go out to eat. But there's a difference between choosing to live a simple life lifestyle mm -hmm. and being forced to not have a place to sleep yeah. or a bed of one's own or not having a variety of foods such as fruits and vegetables. Yeah. So the, the difference is poverty is when you cannot have, right. when you yeah. cannot manage to meet your basic needs. When my oldest child was in college, uh, she would call and, and make requests. And I would tell her that um, we couldn't afford to do certain things. 
Right. And she would start to feel like we were poor. Mm. And I would tell her, we're not poor. You're just hanging around people who have so much more than we do that it makes it feel feel it makes you feel like you're poor, but you're not poor. You just don't have what some of the people around you have. And Mm -hmm. I would tell her, maybe you need to consider getting some different friends. (laughs) (laughs) So some sometimes it's it's all about perspective. It Mm -hmm. I mean the fact that that she was in college and had her own car to drive. And had food to eat and clothes to wear meant that she wasn't poor, but she had friends who had, they had so much more yep. and they could do so much, but that didn't make her poor. And I would always have to make that distinction that you're not poor. You're just mm-hmm. hanging around people with so much more. And then on the flip side of that, when my second daughter went to college, she came home and said, mom, I didn't realize how privileged I was until I went to college because she had a whole different set of friends. They Mm -hmm. went to two different colleges, but the second daughter had a whole different set of friends. Right. And her friend group made her feel privileged and rich. And we were in the same economic status that we had been before. It was Mm -hmm. just a matter of which friend group they hung out with. Yeah. I think that's really uh, important um, advice that you gave to your, to your children, that, um, when you brought in the world around you in terms of your friend group, you get to see more and experience more and understand more. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And in addition to children needing to understand, um, the difference between poverty and privilege, right. And that there's a, uh, a, a wide, right, um, gap in between those two. Um, there's something else that I hope that teachers will um, consider with students. Many schools have bake sales and coat drives and, you know, collect can resources and kids come to believe that change is possible by giving more. But what I'm hoping the kind of teaching in schools uh, that occurs and at home is, is, is the kind of teaching that helps children to understand that the change that's needed is toward the conditions, the laws, the policies and practices that are causing the need for the coats and the canned food collection in the first place. And and in that way, kids can begin to empathize rather than sympathize with those navigating food and housing insecurity and uh, who are living in poverty and to start considering ways they can take action that leads to economic justice. So you've preemptively written an explanation about uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory um, in The Lucky Ones, uh, which plays an important role in the life of the main character, Ellis. And you've explained that that book depicts Black people inhumanely. Recognizing that your main character would not have had many choices during this time period that even featured Black characters respectfully, let alone book choices written by Black people. How did you navigate this tension and ultimately decide to include this problematic text? Okay. I had decided to include the text before I made the discovery. Mm -hmm. So as I was beginning to write The Lucky Ones, it came to me that I should write about how Ellis girl was afraid to read books without pictures because that's how I was. I didn't read a novel until I was in seventh grade and I was a a good student, made all A's, but I was so afraid to read a book if it didn't have pictures in it. So I wanted to have that experience for Ellis Earl and I wanted him to read a book throughout the, the novel. And the first book that came into my head was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory because Charlie Bucket is really poor. 
and Ellis Earl needed someone he, he could identify with. So I had already begun writing the story, had included Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, had chosen that book. And then I made the discovery about the Oompa Loompas. At first, I addressed it within the narrative, but then I thought about whether or not Ellis Earl would really pick up on that or if he would just enjoy the book. So I decided to leave it out of the narrative and put it in an author's note. I think if if we have the goal of looking to inspire a love of literature, you know, within all children, we have to confront the issue of racism in texts written in uh, not only today, but in historical periods um, without whitewashing the pain or lionizing the author who created the, the problematic text. Because one way children are socialized into racist ideas is through literature. So they may not pick up on it, but it is planting a seed in their minds. And we know that depictions of Black people as animals, as not human, is a long-standing racist trope in, in literature. And children deserve to see themselves presented in powerful, humane ways. Children deserve to know the truth about authors like Roald Dahl, who, who were unapologetically racist and anti-Semitic and the ways their ideas are entrenched in their work. I mean, even his family, Roald Dahl's family is apologizing for his um, problematic um, ideology. And, and I think children deserve the opportunity to discuss how or when to live with artistic creations while possibly condemning the creator. What's now and next for you? What can readers look forward to uh, in terms of any new books that you might be working on? I, I don't have anything coming out anytime soon, but I am writing contemporary mm. now. I'm still middle grade and um, just, I'm, I'm moving toward contemporary, want, want to do something a little fun, uh, a little shorter than what I've been writing and hoping to just reach kids with something um, that's uh, pertaining to today, but um, still impactful and still has a little bit of a social justice bent to it. Well, Linda, you're writing um, in the Lucky Ones lifts the stigma around poverty and in its place casts a humane light on Black people, their lived experiences, as well as their hopes and their dreams. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? I can show young Black kids that they can do this too. If, you know, if they love the written word, they love imagining and creating stories, then you can be a writer. If I can be a writer, if I can grow up in a home with no books, if I can not read a novel until I'm 12 years old, if I can um, not have any books available to me unless I go to the library and still grow up and be a writer, and I think it shows hope for for children that you can you can do this too. And that that's that's one thing that I'm proud of being a black creative is just hopefully inspiring that in of uh, in young people that they will do creative fields like writing and art. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for this um, invitation to interview. I have enjoyed the chat. Thank you. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Black Creators Series, a Candlewick Press and Red Clay Educators collaboration. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you won't miss an episode. For more information about the Black Creators Series, go to blackcreatorsseries.candlewick.com or soniacherrypaul.com. 
or go to Red Clay Ed on Twitter and Instagram.